they leave because they should or they find someone else and some of them some of them forget me i suppose in the end they break my heart hello and welcome back to the doctor who marathon i'm your host mickey dan and today we're going to be talking about the 2008 christmas special the next doctor written by russell t davis and directed by torchwood director andy goodard uh this is as I stated, the 2018 Christmas special. It's, despite it being part of the Series 4 production, it is actually part of the series specials that uh, were all linked in into 2009 and act as a swan song to the Tenth Doctor era. Each Basically, it had like its own short series run where there is this theme going around about the Do Tenth Doctor's mortality with this one basically teasing a future incarnation of the doctor so uh with that uh on its mind it features of course the cybermen as well as shown on the cover here and also features david morrissey playing a presumably next incarnation of the doctor and this was a huge Fuel to the flame, shall we say, because this story, uh, despite being filmed before David Tennant decided to leave, this was the first story to air after he announced it. I think in previous videos I stated other episodes were aired after, which that's how I remember it, but apparently, according to the Wikipedia, this story was the first story released after the announcement, which is really strange. Now, um, this story is uh, very unliked. It was a very unpopular story. A lot of people seem to not like this particular story, whether it's due to the lack of great Cyberman interactions or whether they just have a genuine plot problems with the plot. You know, there's a lot of criticisms and fair and justified. And if you're one of those people, fair enough. In some ways, I am on your side. But that is uh, the general consensus of the story. Now, before I actually tackle the story, as uh, usually, this is the official uh, BBC DVD cover, which is very nice. And it's kind of fallen on the floor over here. But uh, as always, I've printed out my own uh, DVD cover to match it with the classic series. So, are you ready? One, two, three. There you go. So um, that's what it looks like on my shelf. There we got uh, this amazing artwork by um, Christopher Doctor Who DVD covers, which I highly recommend if you want some replacement covers. This is just gorgeous work, and it's actually one of my favourites. I believe this is also the first DVD cover I printed out for myself. So that's some uh, really cool stuff, like uh, David Tennant's sheepish face. Look at this, his eyes look a bit strange. They look like they've been photoshopped. That's very strange. Um, I think it's just the uh, the photograph. And now here's the spine, if anyone is interested. Here's the uh, David Tennant play. I don't know why I did that in, a, in an accent, but there you go. Wow. <laughs> and then here is the um, the back. Sorry, the reflection there. Showing the, the new cyber leader. Uh, Morrison and David Tennant, and you've got, um, what was her name? Good heart? Uh, Harkin. It's Harkin by there. So anyway, that's the, um, that's the DVD, that's the, uh, the behind the scenes a bit, and that's uh, also the general consensus. But do I enjoy it? Is this a good story in terms of my personal opinion? Well, let's find out. So, the story starts off with the Doctor arriving in 1851. And right off the bat, what this story has to offer is a fantastic visual style. As Andy Gotthard has proven with his tortured work, he is a very, very confident director. We get some really great swooshing uh, camera movements. And like there's, there's just a whole bit at the start where there's no dialogue. It's just the Doctor roaming around his small... Um, this small little area 
and he's just seeing people just enjoying the Christmas spirit and you have Murray Gold's music just -na 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 just put right off the bat the story puts a massive smile in your face and you just see the doctor no dialogue he's just into, he's just smiling around her as he's looking around and i love i just love this small moment i know it's such a small like it has nothing really to do with the story or narrative and i'm probably spending way too much on a scene which has no bearing on the plot whatsoever but it just, right off the bat, I think there's two or three reasons why this scene is so gorgeous, in my opinion. Uh, one is that after the absolutely depressing ending of Journey's End, though yes, it does kind of clash when you watch those back to back. Luckily for me, I had the Sarah Jane adventures uh, to kind of give like a little bit of, of relief into these two stories, so... It doesn't seem like they're right back to back. But a marathon, it does kind of feel strange if you're only doing Doctor Who. But anyway, um, this this opening just basically just puts you in a good mood. It's just like, ah, the Doctor's just enjoying himself. And therefore, I'm just enjoying myself. And also, which is my second reason, is that we finally just get to see why the Doctor does what the Doctor does. Why he travels. He doesn't do it to fight monsters, to fight baddies to constantly have his friends tortured, humiliated, and sometimes even murdered. But it's because he just enjoys traveling and just likes seeing people enjoy the surroundings that, they, that they're in. He just loves to travel. He loves to experience things. And this is no exception. And right off the bat, that is just a great way to open a Doctor Who story for a special event, like a 2008 Christmas special, for example. So, right off the bat, we're on a great start. And I must be honest, I don't think anything really tops just the pure joy of that scene. But the Doctor's just like, you know, looking around, he's just smiling, he's, um, he's thinking, ah, oh, uh, 1851, great year, a bit dull, um, only for someone to start shouting out his name. Doctor! Doctor! And the Doctor, he looks, the camera, like, zooms up on his face. I am God, just... Because I'm just going to repeat myself constantly, Andy Gotthard is probably one of the best directors. Despite him only directing one tenth Doctor story, he's probably one of he's probably easy up there, uh, along with Eurolin and say Graham Harper as one of the best directors of the tenth Doctor era. I mean, it's this story. I just can't help but say that this story is just visually a piece of art. I'm telling you, but so the Doctor. Zooms up, zooms up on the doctor's face, he smiles as he's ready to get into the adventure, ready to get in into uh, another fun little run around as he uh, goes running and he finds this uh, girl, uh, Rosita, and he's basically, it's like, um, okay, whatever behind these doors, it's dangerous, you better stay back, I'm here, I'm the doctor, I'm going to help you, and this woman, she's like, who the hell are you? I'm the doctor. Doctor who? No, 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 just, just the doctor. There can't be two of you. Ah, oh, there you are. And David Tennant's doctor turns around to see another man in a very um, flamboyant um, Victorian costume. And that is David Morris's character, uh, for which we will call for the moment the next doctor. This is the, the tease, which is uh, presumably or at least from the 10th Doctor's perspective at this point, is a future incarnation. And right off the bat, we're all just like in a state of amazement and confusion. And what this does is really well, in my opinion, looking back, is that it puts the audience right into the 10th Doctor's point of view. This story could easily be one of David Tennant's, as the 10th Doctor's most relatable story because as the he's confused we as an audience member are also confused because despite him having seen clearly some having some gaps in his memory he knows what the TARDIS is he calls himself a time lord and he presumably has a sonic screwdriver although the audience don't get a good glimpse of it at the moment as the tenth door is just wandering around 
and stuff. And then uh, the pre credit sequence ends with the doors um, that Rosita was screaming because she was trying to keep the door locked, opens up, and it turns out to be a, some sort of strange Cyberman-like entity, which gets named um, Shades in this story, which are like these... Um, to, they're like basic animals, like a cat or a dog, that have been converted. And so, despite them obeying Cybermen orders, they still have this like animal, um, animal movements, and they turn their heads in curiosity, and they climb, and they're like, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and that's the end of the pre-credit sequence. And I think this story does a great job at setting up its... Uh, plot lines in this story with the pre-credit sequence and then like I said that that scene in the small little village is just absolutely gorgeous and it's not going to stop talking about that through the entire video probably because I'm just absolutely mental but anyway uh, <laughs> now a lot of people have a lot of great criticisms of the story and I'll get into them when we tackle them but one criticism with this story, which, though I do see, I do understand, but in terms of, because people really, really, really hated the Shades. And I don't understand why. I mean, sure, they don't have that Cyberman robotic, completely logical feel to them, as they're much more animal than machine. Clearly more of a beast than anything. They're not like the worst thing that's come out of Cybermen canon. Come on. Like, I, I get it. I get why people don't like them. But, inter but absolutely hate and despise them. I honestly just don't understand. Sure, they don't get enough to do here. But it's not like they're actively... Uh, they're actively making the plot worse by having them in the plot. They're just kind of this strange, unique Cyberman design. And that's pretty much it. Um, uh, when we get back into the episode, we have this really fun little action moment, which we'll get onto a little bit as well, about like, one of the criticisms of the story, which is um, really justified. Uh, where the Doctor's... Does this count as a multi-doctor story? Hmm. I don't know. But anyway, we have uh, the tenth doctor and the next doctor uh, going around chasing this shade. And there's a great moment where they're pulling this rope that, um, uh, that the next doctor has tried to capture the shade, but only it to escape. And but not after the two doctors have their ass skidding across the floorboards. And the scene where it got away, but the two doctors are just absolutely pissing themselves laughing. And it cuts to them going down the stairs, and they're still laughing as Rosita is just like, For God's sakes, you two, we failed. What are you laughing about? That is really, the story is really great at putting you in a good mood. It's not like the most engaging thing, but it's like it just makes puts a smile on your face of just how fun the story is in terms of the setup. Because now we come into like the first real criticism with the story as we start setting up the plot of the next doctor as the as basically the tenth doctor learns that um, this next doctor has no memory of the tenth doctor. He doesn't know who he is. The face, he says, he kind of recognises, but, um, like, nothing really comes to mind. And that basically becomes the main vocal point of the story. And right off the bat, we have two problems here. One is, um, I think, let's get the, the, the big one out of the way, is that the Cybermen in this story are basically... There, you can replace these monsters with any other creatures in the Doctor Who canon, or basically introduce a new Doctor Who man's monster, and the story would be really no different, with nothing really um, 
the, the story does not tackle anything of the philosophy of the Cybermen and what makes them so scary. They're just sort of stompy army people in this story, which is a crying shame. However, I do have sympathy for Russell T. Davis because though we he did retcon the Cybermen in a in a in this in the revived series, the Cybermen come from a parallel universe where now the idea that the Cybermen wanted to turn like this isn't actually there anymore. They all got forcefully converted, unwillingly converted into Cybermen, which means that there's only really a handful of stories you can do with the revived Cybermen, and it is one of the big criticisms I have with the revived series. However, stating that Andy Goddard's directing the Cybermen is gorgeous. He gives the Cybermen so much presence, uh, despite the story not really giving them much uh, to do. Um, and there are some really great action beats with them, especially with uh, there's a scene where they break into Jackson Lake's house. Um, somebody who is presumably the first person to be murdered by the Cybermen, to which the next Doctor is investigating his death. And uh, the story takes place during the events of his funeral, um, as, as um, Jackson, not Jackson, uh, the, the next Doctor is trying to look through his stuff and is trying to figure out what the Cybermen are doing in Victorian London as the Tenth Doctor basically takes the form of his companion, as he doesn't want to remind um, the next Doctor in case of his amnesia. He says the wrong word, and he states, I personally, that's personally one of my big issues with this story, is that that line with the Doctor is like, sorry, I'm afraid I can't, I shouldn't say, you know, with amnesia, you say the wrong word, and what the hell is he on about? If it wasn't for the fact that, you you know, with the plot twist later on and you can't really push um, push it with the, the fact that he's not, but we learn about him later on in terms of the plot. But in terms of, like, from the Tenth Doctor's perspective here, why doesn't he just keep pushing to remember this is his future incarnation needing his help? Why doesn't he push for the, uh, the, the future Doctor, from his point of view, to gain his memory. I don't know, that's just me. But that does lead into a, another bigger issue, is that we get this really fun action piece moment with the two Doctors, and we have this fun interaction. But then, throughout the most of the plot after this, um, the next Doctor is completely overshadowed by his plot line of of this memory he's having, this this idea of him having these memory losses, and he's constantly paralyzed by the fear of having his memories wiped and is getting out. Now, this leads into some really great scenes. With um, there's this great moment where the tenth Doctor is he's, he's gone to the tenth Doctor for comfort when they're investigating, as he kind of can see the Tenth Doctor in his memories. And the Tenth Doctor basically tells him that the answer could be in the fog watch that he's wearing, only as, um, uh, which is obviously a reference to Utopia with the, the stopwatch being where what hides the Master's um, consciousness, oh, and human nature as well, the Tenth Doctor also. And so he opens the fog watch only for it to fall collapse pieces and turns out it's just for decoration. Uh, a nice little uh, fog watch. Like an ordinary fog watch. And I really like this setup because you think it could lead into something and then it turns out to be a red herring and later on it will still be continuing on from being a big part of the plot. And I really like that little twist. But it does kind of mean that David Morrissey's performance is kind of overshadowed by the plot because, in, because this is the story where we get this whole narrative with the next Doctor. This is supposed to be a fun uh, adventure with the Tenth Doctor interacting what is presumably a future incarnation. But 
We don't get to spend a lot of time with the two doctors' interactions. It's mainly this doctor suffering from this amnesia and basically just relies on the doc tenth on the real doctors constantly. Um, but there's and there's not real much he gets to do. There's even a bit when they're in Jackson Lake's house that um, uh, the Cybermen coming in and they start chasing after the two doctors only for David Morrissey's uh, incarnation to really just be sidelined as he's looking at this device that they have found um, an info stamp and is kind of like paused and puzzled at it whilst the tenth doctor is the one who gets the sword out has a fun little action beat on the stairs and announces that he is the doctor um, take him but leave this man alone and so yeah and another big issue because this story is Call the next Doctor. When you go into this story, that's what you would think the plot is about. However, we get the Jackson Lake scene, we get uh, the info stamp. The Doctor then calls upon the uh, to see the, the TARDIS of the next Doctor, only to be revealed that it's a air balloon. I'm trying to remember what the, he calls it. Um, Travelling... Through, no, I can't remember, but it, uh, it ends with in style, which I really like, and that's even to a very fun beat. And then the doc, the tenth doctor is like, I've kind of worked out together now what has happened, and he basically, uh, we have this monologue of of what actually happened to the next doctor and how he came to be. That scene, which is basically like the twist, the reveal. Of what actually happened, the end of the mystery, is how Act Two starts. The next Doctor plotline only revolves around one third of an episode called The Next Doctor. Do you see the issue here? And it's kind of a shame as well because that's a really interesting plot. I can't remember if I personally fell for the fact that James David Morrissey was the uh, was actually either going to be the next Doctor. I remember hoping he would because he's just a great, fantastic actor, and the first half of this story really proves that he has the acting chops to play an incarnation of the Doctor. But it's only one third of an episode of a special, which is kind of a bummer. And then after that, he's completely sidelined. So it turns out, spoilers warning if you're, if you're worried about that, is that Jackson Lake came um, to London uh, uh, for the winter time only to find Cybermen in his basement and has taken his wife uh, and seemingly killed her and taken something else and Jackson Lake picked up an info stamp and used it to uh, attack and kill some sidemen in self-defense however some of that information backtracked back into him and that info stamp happened to be one about one particular time lord that's right it's about the doctor and so the doctor's um, the information about the doctor goes back into uh, Jackson Lake and it turns out this next doctor this incarnation of the doctor isn't actually an inca incarnation at all it turns out to be Jackson Lake and the resolution the 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 the, the, the showing of this is phenomenal with uh, the tenth doctor turning the fog watch to show um, JL Jackson Lake's initials and the tenth doctor using the info stamp to show clips, which I'd like to add is the first time in the Revived series where we had actual footage of the classic series, showing, basically confirming that this is the, the continuation of the classic series with uh, William Hartnell, Patrick Crouton, John Pertwee, Tom Baker, Peter Davison, Colin Baker, Sylvester McCoy, Paul McGann, Christopher Eccleston, and of course ending it with the 10th, the current 10th Doctor, David Tennant himself. 
and that's where the resolution becomes. And that is really cool. And though it's like an um, expedition, ex expedition, I can't say the word, Explain explaining dialogue, um, David Tennant absolutely owns it. And it's clearly one of his one of the best scenes of the Tenth Doctor era, but it means after this point, two thirds of the story, Jackson Lake gets nothing to do apart from really mope. There's a scene in which he he comes in to save the Doctor and Rosita, but in terms of a narrative structure, he's kind of a non-entity in the, the second two halves, which is really disappointment because. That means now the plot is mainly now focusing on the Cybermen and the introduction to uh, Miss Hardigan, this matron who basically got fed up of the men who she was working for and she'd made an alliance with the Cybermen to basically conquer um, Victorian, was it Edwardian? Vic I'm going to say Victorian. Victorian London and she will become... Uh, its ruler using uh, Cyberman influence. Of course, they quickly betray her, but yeah. And so, our main vocal story point is this dynamic, is the dynamic between the, the Cybermen and um, Hardigan. I keep looking at the thing to get her name. Now, the thing about Hardigan is, I personally enjoy the character mainly due to the performance, I will admit. However, for cl clarity sakes, a lot of people didn't like this character, seeing her as a one-beat, one-note character who we don't get a lot of backstory to to really justify her character, and so she comes off as just this, um, this shouty, mean-spirited lady for seemingly very little reasoning uh despite really only like she does get like explanation of why she does this but it's just like a few a few bits of dialogue which doesn't really give you the feel of what her character is going through and so a lot of people don't like her character because of that and i completely see i completely understand in some ways i agree most ways in fact i do agree but i just love the uh, the actress to Hate it. And I think this is where the story really divides people in terms of what the general opinion is and what my personal opinion is. Because I feel like in two thirds of the story that the main interest of the story is with um, Hardigan and the Cybermen. And a lot of people weren't interested in that. And I understand, I justify it. So the, if you don't like the story for that, that's completely reasonable, that's completely fine. In fact, I agree in some regards. But I still like it nonetheless. It's so fun and engaging and it really brings out the Tenth Doctor's swashbuckling nature as he's hiding around and you've got all of these um, cyber slaves uh, bringing these uh, children in and the Doctor finds this massive factory and he goes around swinging with the, on the ropes and he has the sword and overall it's just, you know, it's just a big action-packed Victorian adventure. And it's just a lot of fun. And I think and Andy Goddard is mainly the main reason why this story works so well. Not really Russell T. Davis, if we're going to be honest. Because this story does have a massive problem, which even I cannot defend. So basically, let me wrap up the story. Um, the Doctor, uh, Rosita, and and um, Jackson Lake, we would call him now, they basically track down the Cybermen and taken the children to, uh, to build up this, this factory whilst uh, the Cyber Leader, which can I just say, the Cyber Leader design with the black um, face mask and the exposed brain like the Cyber Leader, a uh, Cyber Controller, sorry, absolutely stunning and is probably one of the best looking Cybermen of the... 2006 designs but anyway and what happens then is basically we learn that the other thing that was taken from Jackson Lake was his son and he completely freezes he completely panics he starts in tears 
Um, he does try to go to the stairs, but explodes, and he's made completely helpless. As the Tenth Doctor goes up and saves the boy, as then the Tenth Doctor then goes to the Jackson Lakes TARDIS, the air balloon goes up and uh, basically stops Hardigan, who's now being mind controlled by the Cybermen, who somehow her brain was able to be so strong that it actually overpowered the Cyberman's conditioning and she becomes this emotional leader. She's basically still the same character, not really converted, only now she has the powers of a Cyberman in that regard. And so the David Tennant, this doctor, uses this gun um, to revert uh, Hardigan's memory mind control so that she's free of the cyber connection, allowing the Cybermen to basically have her. Well, that sounded really wrong. I don't know what that was. And uses a Dalek time, I can't remember what he calls it. It's not a dimension cannon. Um, dimension something which puts it through the vortex to uh, harmlessly disintegrate. And that sounds like a great fun adventure. And let's, and I must be honest, I didn't have a problem with it until somebody pointed it out. Um, this massive issue with the plot. Why didn't Jackson Lake be the one to save the day? Think about it. This story is building this plot line up. That, that Jackson Lake... Um, he was petrified, he's scared, and he basically became the Doctor because his mind just couldn't cope. And the Tenth Doctor gives him the speech and how the, it just raced his, changed his mind memory, but it couldn't change the person inside you. That bravery, that determination, that investigating skills, that's all you, that's all down to you. And um, there's this whole other plot line as well of the when, he's the, when we think of him as the next Doctor... He has this fear of opening the luggage and he has this fear of going into the TARDIS, uh, the, the air balloon, and riding it one day, uh, stating that's like you'll only ride it when London is safe. And that seems to be building up this, this climactic conclusion where the character gets this determination, gets this story arc, his conclusion with... Uh, having this brief moment where he either saves his son or he finally um, uses his TARDIS to fly up and tries to deal with the Cybermen. But nothing like that happens. In the final act of the story, he's got a complete non-entity. And it's a real shame because David Morrissey really deserves better. And it's something which I really cannot forgive the story for. Like, as much as I really enjoy and had a lot of fun, blasted this adventure, that missed opportunity, an opportunity which I think the story was even felt like it was teasing, it felt like just a natural conclusion to the story, just doesn't happen. And really takes the, the sails out of, of the plotline of the next Doctor, leaving it completely... The Tenth Doctor uh, story, if that makes any sense as a criticism, probably not. And so the story ends with um, David Morrissey's uh, Jackson Lake. Uh, they're having this de this debate about um, come to Sunday, come to Christmas dinner, because uh, for all, in memory of all the people we've lost, of course Jackson Lake is talking about his his departed wife. Uh, there's this really fun moment where he goes into the TARDIS. Does Jackson Lake count as a one-off companion? I think that's up to... I personally consider it. I'd love to see a big finish spin-off with Jackson Lake. Personally. If you think so, comment down below, please. Let's start a petition. Get David Morrissey onto Big Finish. We deserve this. <laughs> and... David Tennant's, uh, the Tenth Doctor, gives this speech about, like, how all of his people left him because I did it in the opening. And so, uh, the next Doctor, Jackson Lake, uh, David Morrissey's incarnation, whatever you want to call him, invites the Doctor to dinner, 
uh, Christmas dinner. It's no longer a request, it's a demand. And the story ends with them happily going off as the tense doctor is actually able to change his mind and goes to a Christmas dinner. And that's the next Doctor. Overall, this story is weak. I will admit that. It has a huge problems in terms of plot and pacing. Cybermen, in terms of Cybermen, are very one note and really, like, missed, like, the mark. And are really just stompy, um... Creatures, at least in my opinion. I know somebody who actually really likes the the Cybermen and the next Cybermen, given this whole uh, head canon that they've gone slightly mad due to the void and the whole idea of them having the Cyber King and all that um, was actually like them like adaptating Victorian values into them because they've they're now in Victorian London, which is a completely justifiable opinion, if you ask me. But personally, it didn't do anything for me. Um, but this story just has so much fun going for it. If it's not Andy Goddard's directing, it's David Morrissey and David Tennant working off each other so well. Even though the plot line with them just finishes way too early for what a story called The Next Doctor should be. I can't help, I don't know. I actually, it's. I don't think I can really explain why I like this story. It's, it's not even I like. I love it. This is one of the stories I've probably watched the most when it comes to the Tenth Doctor era, and I can't. And it's really embarrassing as somebody who talks about Doctor Who because I can't really explain why I like it. All I can do is tell about all the stuff I hate. I have issues with like the One Note Cybermen and the fact that the plot really finishes two acts too early. I don't know. This is embarrassing. This is embarrassing. I do apologise. But I personally just have a lot of fun with this. And it's one of the stories that I just constantly just watch all the time. <laughs> this is a really bad video. I do apologise. So let's just end it. This is, that's the, uh, the next Doctor. So join me next time where the Sarah Chain and her crew have to help a intergalactic policeman find a fugitive. So join me next time for Prisoner of the Jadoon. And I'll see you next time on the Doctor Who Marathon. Ta-ra!